Texas History Lessons, Lesson 5, The First Texans, Part 3. Having evolved some two million years ago in Africa, humans, our ancestors, fully developed in mental and physical capacities, began to spread out from that continent about 70,000 years ago, and by 40,000 years ago they had reached most of the livable parts of Europe and Asia. We have evidence that humans had reached Siberia by this time. Humans had even reached Australia, signifying some kind of skill at water travel. As part of these world migrations, we have to include the waves of migrations into the Americas. The land bridge of Beringia existed between 70 and 30,000 years ago, then again from 25 to 15,000 years ago, and then one last time between 14,000 and 10,000 years ago, each being a window of opportunity for entering the Americas. And successive waves through ice corridors along the Pacific coast or even along the coast in watercraft, they moved into the Americas. Just beyond the edges of the ice sheets, they found a stable, cool, humid climate and migrated southward from Alaska along the ice corridor east of the Rocky Mountains, reaching the Great Plains in the heart of North America. They found themselves opened up to thousands of square miles of territory, reaching all the way down into South America. The nomadic bands, probably having come across in multiple waves over thousands of years, spread in different directions, going after different game and different habitats, leading to cultural and linguistic diversity. Some, apparently by at least 18,000 years ago, reached the present-day territory of the modern state of Texas. It is important to reiterate that these people were fully evolved. They were fully modern humans in terms of intellectual and physical ability. To re-quote W.W. W. Newcomb, they were the most formidable, vicious, and successful mammal ever to adorn the face of the world. They were a lot more fully prepared to survive the last ice age than most modern humans. They had fire, clothing, weapons to hunt with, and for defense. They had domesticated dogs. They had atlatls, and even bone musical instruments. It is also important to note that they did not know that they were doing something historic. They were surviving, working cooperatively. They pursued mammoths and reindeer and other large game. Each region and environment they moved into had an impact of great significance, and they had entered a continent with many different types of plants and animals that they had not encountered in their past on the other continents they had come from. They also traveled along a north-south axis across the Americas as opposed to the east-west axis of traveling in Eurasia. This meant that as they traveled south, it required them to adapt to more different environments as they approached the equator and then went away from it towards Tierra del Fuego than it had been for people to travel west from modern Turkey to China. It affected the shelters they lived and the ornaments they adorned themselves with, the clothes they wore, and the tools they developed and used. In Texas, this was no different. And because Texas is a transitional zone, and extremely large in size with extremely diverse ecosystems, the diversity of cultures within its modern-day territory is somewhat greater than some other states and their First Nations diversity. Research divides the Texas prehistorical archaeological record into five general periods. The pre-Clovis period from as early as 18,000 to 13,400 years ago. The Paleo-Indian stage of 13,400 to 10,000 years ago. The Archaic Stage of 10,000 years ago to the beginning of the Christian era or later, depending on the region. The Woodland Era that affected only a certain regions from about 2,500 to 1,150 years ago, 1,150 years ago. And the Late Prehistoric Era of 1,250 to 1,150, starting about then to 420 years ago. Before we dig into these stages, let's take a look at the different regions and what the First Peoples encountered there. It's not unlikely to imagine that they first started in the Panhandle and then spread to the Pecos Canyon country and then across eastward to the Gulf Coast, but the strongest pre-Clovis evidence is in Central Texas. Evidence from the Galt site in Central Texas suggests that the earliest known modern inhabitants of Texas date as far back as 20,000 years ago. Galt has evidence for pre-Clovis human groups occupying the Buttermilk Creek Valley area in Bell County. The tools that were left behind demonstrate that people were living as hunter-gatherers in Texas between 16,000 and 20,000 years ago. Most of the tools were made from chert, a local material from seams and limestone outcrops in the Edwards Plateau. 
These people were engaged in hunting and foraging. They processed meats, animal skins, and harvested plant materials. They also manufactured and maintained tools made of stone, bone, antler, and wood. Further downstream along Buttermilk Creek is a freaking site with evidence of cultural materials from between 13,000 and 15,000 years ago. Both of these sites are found in central Texas along the edge of the Edwards Plateau in the Blackland Prairie. It's an area rich in natural resources, and it made an attractive place for humans in these regions in Texas almost continually for a millennia. There are other pre-Clovis sites reported across Texas, but evidence is more limited. The Wilson Leonard site in Williamson County has a small number of pre-Clovis chipped stone flakes. Near Langtree, Texas, in Val Verde County, is the Bonfire Shelter site. This is an exciting one. It's the oldest mass bison kill site in the Americas and dates back to around 14,000 years ago. The Cueva Quebrada site, aging as old as 16,000 years, is in a small cave high on a cliff overlooking the Rio Grande, also in Val Verde County, and it contains evidence for burned bone with butchering marks. In Oasis County, there is evidence from Petronilla Creek sites of stone tools made of stone and bone, including bone tools with butchery marks. The mammoth bones dates back 18,000 years. Starting with the Panhandle and Plains, the Panhandle, when first arrivals made it across into North America, the Panhandle was cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter than it is now, and it provided a much more attractive climate than today's Texas has. It received abundant rainfall, at least double what it is today and what we now know as an arid region. It was a savanna of grass and sage. There were valleys of juniper and oak and streams, ponds, and marshes. Here they hunted the 12 to 14 tall at the shoulder mammoths and the bison antiquus using spears with four to five inch points that they threw with their atlatl that could generate speeds of over 70 miles per hour. Near Miami, Texas, also in the Panhandle, there's a site where five mammoths were killed and butchered. It was in the Texas Panhandle that what some people like to call Texas's first industry developed. At a site known as Alabates Quarry on the Canadian River that possibly dates back 13,000 years, and the Gibson Quarry north of San Angelo, early peoples harvested large amounts of flint stone. Caches of stone from these sites have been found in Oklahoma and New Mexico, suggesting that there might have been trade in the valuable stone. And it's strongly even suggested further that it was definitely traded because Alabate's flint has been found as far away as Minnesota and the Pacific Coast. The peoples that moved south into the West Texas trans was also found in Savannah-like lands covered with grass and trees. The terrain was rougher, but it wasn't necessarily a detriment. It provided cliffs that the hunters could stampede bison over. The fall would kill some, and the ones that it injured, the hunters would dispatch. At San Angelo State Park on the shores of O.C. Fisher Reservoir and near the city of San Angelo, we found archaeological findings dating back to 18,000 years. In far west Texas is an area that's been termed the Hornada Mogollon region. The Hornado was defined as a branch of the prehistoric Mogollon cultures of southern New Mexico and Arizona. The cultures centered around the people in the Membres Valley and are named after the Mogollon Mountains. This is jumping quite a bit ahead, but beginning about 900 AD or in the Common Era, they began to make an evocative pottery. The culture covered a large region, including El Paso and Hudspeth counties, the western Transpecos area. The culture is characterized by the use of brownware pottery and pit house architecture. They existed as early as 13,000 years ago and persisted to about 400 years ago. There are varied examples of settlement, including campsites, pit houses, villages, agave baking pits, pueblos, and rock art localities. Each population in that area is thought to have been sparse until the warming period that began 4,500 years ago, and ceramics were in use here 1,800 years ago. By 700 years ago, the Hornada people resided in Pueblo settlements, some with up to 150 rooms. Each Pueblo room block had a large civic room with special floor features and subfloor pits, and these rooms were ritually burned when the Pueblo was abandoned. They lived on cultivated corn, which had been domesticated in Mexico 9,000 years ago, beans, and squash. 
Art of this time included symbols of ancestral mountains, emergences from caves, rain, ancestors, clan symbols, and deities were painted on rock art panels. They also painted symbols and art on vessels and carved in stone, bone, and marine shell. People of this time obtained pottery, turquoise, and marine shells through widespread trade networks with people in northern Mexico and western and central New Mexico. The eastern Trans-Pecos and Big Bend region of Texas is the northeast division of the Chihuahuan Desert, the largest desert in North America. It covers more than 310,000 square miles. The terrain is differentiated by montane basin environments that grade in elevation from almost 9,000 feet in the Guadalupe Mountains to just below 2,000 feet at the Rio Grande. And there is evidence of habitation back to 13,500 years ago. As the climate shifted and became even drier than it was, more like it is today, there is evidence of earthen ovens and increased reliance on succulents and plants for survival. In central Texas, the people that moved there first would have found mammoths and giant bison as well. Central Texas is going to define it as with the Trinity on the east, the Gulf on the south, and the Noasis on the west. The climate was cooler and more humid with less change between the seasons than it is the present. This made differences in growing season and provided a more stable environment to live in. Marshes covered the coast, and then forests covered most of the upper coast, and it was also savanna-like. Mastodons were numerous on the upper coast, preferring the forested lands to the grasslands. And mammoths and the giant bison also lived between the Rio Grande and the Sabine rivers. There were giant tortoises, dire wolves, saber-toothed cats. Little is known of how the Gulf Coast's first peoples lived due to the lack of archaeological sites and the higher probability that they needed to move more often because of their lifestyles. Remember, during the Ice Age, the waters of the ocean had been hundreds of feet lower. When the first people reached the Texas Gulf, it would have still been 300 to 320 feet lower than it is today, so any coastal sites would be submerged. Once sea levels stabilized about 3,000 years ago, populations in the coastal area increased dramatically, and these people, who became the inhabitants of the current coast which wasn't a coast at the time, were there for several thousand years. They were well inland 13,000 years ago when the shoreline was 50 to 100 miles farther out in the Gulf of Mexico. What the true nature of the first Gulf Coast peoples was lies far out in the Gulf. But the inhabitants of what is now our coast took advantage of the rich array of marine and estuary resources. They could gather and catch oysters, marsh clams, numerous fish species such as red and black drum, sheep's head, and hard head catfish. They could also dive on migratory waterfowl like mallard and black ducks and sandhill and whooping cranes that became available at certain times of the year. They filled their diets out with deer and bison. Moving on to East Texas, people that have lived in Northeast and East Texas for at least 13,000 years. The first peoples to use these lands were mobile hunter-gatherers like most of the state, and these foragers, and these foragers continued to use the area for millennia. About 2,500 years ago to 1,150 years ago, during the woodland period, the prehistoric peoples there began to settle down in small villages and camps dispersed across recognizable territories. A few of the sites, such as Coral Snake and Jonas Short, were used as burial mounds. Other features found here include pits and ovens with concentrations of burned rocks used in hot rock cooking. There isn't much evidence of the living structures that they had. Known as the Fouche, Maline, Mossy Grove, and Mill Creek cultures, these people were surely ancestral Caddo peoples. They also made several kinds of plain and decorated pottery vessels. In North Texas, between East Texas and the Panhandle, north of Central Texas, there's also evidence of habitation since 13,000 years ago in numerous places. Also, they follow the similar lifestyle of hunter-gatherers. Now, having walked our way through the different regions of Texas and sites and lifestyles of the people that had first lived there, we're going to start going through the different phases of development that the first peoples of Texas underwent, along with the various cultures that developed around them. The Paleo-Indian phase is considered to be 13,400 to 10,000 years ago, but really should probably, in my head, go back to the 18,000 years when we know that they arrived here at the very earliest. As the vast glacial ice sheets covering parts of Eurasia and North America melted, 
the sea rose and the waters of Bering covered the land bridge over which the first peoples are presumed to have crossed from Asia into the Americas. Eventually, when the sea level reached its current level about 3,000 years ago, they were cut off for over thousands of years by about 55 miles of the Bering Strait. The climate began to change. Tundra and glaciers receded. Grasslands and prairies grew, along with hardwood forests. Arid deserts and plateaus also developed. Ice stems began to burst. Sea levels began to rise. As climate changed over thousands of years, it became a, one of more extremes. Instead of the moderate differences between summer and winter, which was especially inviting in Texas early on, it became harsher, with hotter and drier summers and more extreme cold in the winters. Precipitation patterns began to shift to what we have today. More abundant rainfall in eastern Texas and very little in the west. The mass extinctions, of course, had begun 11,700 years ago. The mammoth, mastodon, megahorse, giant sloth, and saber-toothed tiger disappeared along with 35 other species of large fauna in the Americas gone, as we covered in the last lesson, the reason why is a matter of argument. Anything from comet impact, sprayed glass spherules across the northern hemisphere, an enormous stellar event, a supernova core collapse, giant solar flare, or the remnants of a bolide impact that left a blast of high-energy photons and possibly lethal UV radiation in marine cores and tree rings are some of the more controversial suggestions. Most of the time, you'll hear the argument that humanity destroyed the megafauna. Others will add that the changes in climate had it and its effects on the megafauna food supply had a significant impact on the great creature's way of life and led to their demise. The mammoths likely disappeared first, and then the hunters in the Texas Panhandle transitioned to the giant bison. They would kill them, and at the kill site, they would crack the bones and extract the marrow. They would cook some at the kill site, and then they would carry whatever they could to the campsite. And using flint knives, they cleaned and scraped the hides, cooked and smoked the meat. When topography cooperated, the hunters would stampede bison herds into shallow ponds, and then kill the ones injured by the ones running over them from behind. The Archaic period began about 10,000 years ago, continued on to the beginning of the Christian era, or even later, depending on the region. About this time, 10,000 to 7,000 years ago, the people shifted into what archaeologists call the Archaic Phase. Some say it lasted until about 600 in the Common Era. This is the longest archaeological period for the Americas, perhaps because it was a successful way of life. It was also the beginning of diversity. The die-off of the larger animals was a transitional point. The horse, camel, and giant bison of North America died, but... The smaller bison bison, the modern bison that we know, or American buffalo, replaced its larger relative. The large dire wolf's predatory position was replaced by the gray wolf. Jaguars expanded to fulfill the role of the large saber-toothed cats that disappeared. And the people adapted. They had always gathered to supplement their food resources, but the loss of the huge animals they put but with the loss of the huge animals, they put even more emphasis on gathering. Living in small groups of 25 to 30, they moved frequently. Animals that survived in Texas from the Pleistocene to the Holocene for people to hunt included deer, pronghorn antelope, jackrabbits, cottontail rabbits, wild turkeys, vultures, roadrunners, bobcats, cougars, and many other feline species. They also had raccoons, fish, snakes, birds, lizards, rats, and mice. You could add to their menu the following. Hackberries, persimmons, grapes, wild onions, prickly pear stems, and fruit, grass seeds, and yucca. And I'm sure the list could probably be even longer. They would have used anything they could. They began making textiles. They still used atlatls to hunt larger game, but they used clubs for smaller game like rabbits. They began using plants to make baskets, aprons, sandals, and snares. During the Archaic period... Hunting and butchering activities continued in the Panhandle. The peoples also processed plant food in campsites in, campsites in earth ovens. There is evidence of the excavation of wells about 6,500 years ago at the height of a drought period. And people apparently lived in campsites in playa basins, in stream valleys, in spring-fed canyons along the Canadian River breaks and Caprock Canyon escarpment. By 4,500 years ago, the environmental conditions of the Panhandle had reached something similar to our current state. So over thousands of years, they had lived there, and as it, the environment changed, they had been constantly having to adapt. The people left evidence of well-established sites 
that were known to include campsites with rock hearths, barbed dart points, lithic tools, and lithic debris from tool manufacturing activities, occupied rock shelters, and lithic procurement sites. Just to the west of the Pecos area of West Texas developed the basket maker culture that would have become one of the most advanced civilizations of the Americas, the Pueblo. Pueblo culture thrived above the Mogollon territory mentioned earlier and reached east into north and reached into eastern New Mexico next to the Texas Panhandle. About 7,000 years ago, in different pockets around the world, people began to collect seeds of plants to plant, grow, harvest, consume, and store. Three of these pockets were the Middle East, China, and Mesoamerica, and this happened independently. As just mentioned, about this time from 7,000 years ago to 4,000 years ago, or 5,000 to 2,000 BC, there was a changing climate. It was a period of warming and sea levels reached what they are today. About 4,500 years ago, crop growing and mound building began in the Yucatan Peninsula in south central Mexico and Huasteca which is only 150 miles south of the Rio Grande. By 2100 BC, or 4100 years ago, corn agriculture reached sites in New Mexico, Arizona, and the Colorado Plateau. The woodland area is a period that lasted from 2500 to 1150 years ago, only in a few regions, and you can see the, where the regions would be just from the name. Very important point to make here is at a site called Poverty Point in northern Louisiana, just 15 miles east of the Mississippi River, there is evidence of the vibrant Mississippian culture that would emerge and impact the peoples of East Texas. A sedentary or semi-sedentary lifestyle began and people there began building multiple mound complexes. Some had connected terraces around large open plazas 300 yards wide. At least two wood hinges have been discovered there as well. It is believed that they thrived on the aquatic and riverine resources of the Arkansas River. By 1500 BCE, or 3500 years ago, the city covered 910 acres and had as many as 4,000 to 5,000 residents, called by many North America's first city. Most villages in North America, and there were some at that time, had no more than 100. Poverty Point was the largest, but it was not the only mound site or the oldest. One site is west and on the campus of Baton Rouge. It's dated back as far as 6,000 to 4,000 years ago. Agriculture continued to develop and spread. Maize and amaranth were domesticated in northwest Chihuahua, only 50 miles from New Mexico border. And by 2,000 years ago to 1,500 years ago, there's evidence in the panhandle of ceramic manufacture. 1,400 to 1,200 years ago, ceramics in the bow had definitely entered Texas. The pottery of the earlier part of the ceramic period are coarsely tempered in thick-walled cord-marked jars. For some, this time marks the end of the archaic period and the beginning of the prehistoric period. 1,250 years ago, 1,150 years ago in that time period, to 420 years ago, or 600 common era to 1492 common era, is the period of prehistoric Texas. Corn began to spread through North America from the southwest and became common by 700 to 800 common era. And the first peoples of Texas were major transmitters of corn culture from Mexico to the lands of the eastern United States. There was another warming period occurring 800 to 1300 common era. During it, the population of North America increased rapidly, especially during the years 900 to 1200. Horticultural settlements of all sizes grew in number. There were towns and villages that could support 2,000 people, and there were at least two metropolitan areas that could support 30,000 people. Now, these were agricultural, ceremonial, and political centers. They grew and created surpluses of maize, beans, squash, and other plants. The Mississippian-type towns that began to develop about 1,200 years ago centered on mounds were surrounded by defensive structures. By 1,000 to 1,200 common era, Cahokia, which is just east across from the river from St. Louis, Missouri, had become the center of Mississippian culture, which covered much of the eastern United States and reached into East Texas. At its height, Cahokia covered 30,000 acres with up to 15,000 residents and another 20 to 30,000 in the immediate surrounding area. It had huge trade reach hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles and it had huge cultural reach hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles they went into decline for a number of reasons that we won't get into at this moment 
Some of it could be environmental, some of it could be political. Rebellions could have happened. But by 1250 Common Era, it only had 5,000 people, and within 50 years of that, it was abandoned. But the legacy didn't end. After the Cahokian Kingdom's fall, other Mississippian kingdoms sprang up with tens of thousands of mound communities. In the southwest, Spyro, Oklahoma, was the main center for the Caddoan region. Like Cahokia, Chaco Canyon in northwest New Mexico was another significant center that could boast amazing architectural feats. It built many roads, some quite as long as 30 miles, and had many impressive buildings. It flourished during the height of the ancestral Pueblo culture from 900 to 1150 CE. But environment always has something to say. Chaco Canyon suffered a severe drought from 1130 to 1180, and more droughts occurred in the 1200s, forcing migrations. But the Pueblo rebounded after 1350, and set a large Pueblo center, centered around plazas. Just south of the New Mexico border, there were seven-story high apartments on the Rio Casas Grandes. At Cahokia, Chaco Canyon, Casas Grandes, and at the Davis site in the East Texas, astronomers, engineers, and craftsmen made sophisticated facilities for astronomical observation. They were able to measure the movements of the sun, moon and stars and kept mark of the seasons change as well as giving them assurances that their buildings culture and lives were in harmony with the celestial long distance interactive networks span the continent northwest mexico and gulf of california peoples traded millions of marine shells over 500 miles to casas grandes in arizona and new mexico casas grandes in turn received copper metallurgy and copper bell technology from the pacific coast of peru and mexico Casas Grandes also traded scarlet macaw feathers, cast copper bells, and blue and white cotton blankets to the La Junta de los Rios people in West Texas. The culture of the La Junta de los Rios goes back to as early as 1,200 years ago, and they were encountered by Spanish explorers in the 1500s. The La Junta people traded over 500 miles east to Tamaulipas on the Gulf of Mexico and with the East Texas Hassanai. The Caddos of East Texas were closely in culture and trade to Cahokia and to the Aconsa and Tonsa of the Mississippi, and the Mississippian culture stretched to the Atlantic coast. All of these connections show how far a reach over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles through Texas there was trade and possibly even cultural influence. From 1300 to 1800, the world experienced something called the Little Ice Age. This had a negative effect on crops due to colder weather and shorter growing seasons. It brought cold and snow to the Great Plains, possibly forcing the great bison herds even further south to the lower plains of Texas, which had warmer and wetter environment. The southern plains and parts of the Chihuahuan Desert of southwest Texas received more rain during this period and grew more grassy prairies. Bison could thrive and spread to the Gulf Coast, northern Coahuila, and northwest Chihuahua. Plains nations followed the bison south, and people from Coahuila and Chihuahua sent hunters north 400 miles to harvest this meat source. The plains culture of bison hunting had thrived for thousands of years. Environmental problems like the extreme drought or the Little Ice Age often made them make significant moves, but they continued on in their lifestyle. The bison hunters of the southern plains of western Oklahoma and Texas had influence from the Pueblo culture of the Southwest, the bonfire shelter mentioned near Langtree, Texas in Valle Verde County is an example of that plains culture. It wasn't until 550 Common Era that the bow and arrow was adopted by the plains peoples, but it made a significant change. Arrows could be carried in greater numbers and had a greater range than the swift atlatl. By 1528, by 1528, Cahokia, Chaco Canyon and Casas Grandes had faded, but the Mississippian horticultural culture was still strong in the southeast, parts of Arkansas and east Texas, and in the west the Pueblo flourished on the Rio Grande and Pecos in New Mexico. So from the time of arrival to the time of European invasion, over thousands of years, and let's keep in mind, this is thousands of years, and I'm doing this in big broad brush strokes. The peoples of Texas lived in this transitional zone of the North American continent and in transitional zones of several cultures that held sway in the 500 years leading up to 1492. 
the Mississippians to the east, the Pueblo to the west, the Mogollon to the southwest, the Plains culture to the north, and then there were the cultures of the south that we haven't really gotten into, who were the most advanced civilizations. The Maya, the Toltec, the Anahuac, the Anahuac being the Valley of Mexico, the Mexica, better known to us as the Aztecs, and even farther south in South America were the Incas. They would have had an impact on the tribes of northern Mexico and possibly impact through trade with the southern peoples of Texas. By the 1400s, the peoples of the Great Plains had pretty much established themselves where they would be when met by Europeans. Farthest south were, surprisingly, the Caddo of Oklahoma and Texas. They were a people influenced by the Mississippians and the Plains culture, but some archaeologists also consider them part of the Plains culture, showing the nature of them being in the transitional zone. North of them were the Wichita and the Pawnee, who lived in relative harmony with each other and the Caddo. North of them were the Hidatsa, Mandan, and the Arikara, and the Dakotas. To the east of them were the Lakota, who you might know of as the Sioux, who would advance west from the Great Lakes area after European contact. Along the western edge of the Great Plains lived the Kiowa, a people that spoke a language of Pueblo origin, and Texas itself had a number of peoples that reflected the different cultural environmental areas around them. In South Texas, there were Coilticons. A little farther north along the Gulf Coast were the Karankawa. The Plains peoples of Texas were the Lapan Apaches and Tonkawas. In the Northeast were the Caddos, who actually were representative of many different bands that were part of the Caddo Confederacy. And in the Trans-Pecos were the Humanos, the Comanches, Wichita's, Delaware's, and other groups of peoples would arrive later. And these are the most predominantly known names of the larger groups that lived there. There were lists of dozens and dozens of tribal names given. Usually these reflected small bands, each small band going by a different name. And so here we are, ready to take a look at these peoples, their lifestyles, cultures, and then get into the European contact with them post-1492 and start seeing the interaction and changes and everything that happened that led up to the state of Texas existing. Thank you for listening. If you have questions or comments, I'm always happy to take them. You can email me at lowercase Texas History Lessons at gmail.com. You can follow the show at Texas History L on Twitter. There's a Facebook for the show, Texas History Lessons. And please, if you like the show, if you have suggestions that will help it get better, please let me know. And if you like it, share it with a friend. If you know somebody that might also be interested in history, I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Adios.